That is the sexy lipstick markings <laughs> of a certain Holly Moore on today's Fairfield 2.0 with Bob Moore, Holly Moore, sexy lipstick markings. Upstaged already. <laughs> Give me my tea back. <laughs> I want to, I am, uh, you know how thrilled I am to have both of you on here. We're thrilled to be here. We're thrilled to be here. So far, anyway. So far, yeah. yeah. It's not the show so hasn't far. ended yet. Uh, what do you got to say for yourselves? What's going on? Oh, you're supposed to ask us questions. <laughs> yeah, right. Enough of that. I've done that for like 59 billion episodes. Uh, tell me what. Tell me what you're up to as far as. All right. First of all, we'll yes. say this. Okay. We know that you're into making beautiful birdhouses that have been featured. In, <laughs> oh, she's. Oh, get out of here. Get out of here. Oh, around around town, uh, around the square. Uh, but we haven't seen a lot of them lately. What's going on? We need our birdhouses, if you don't mind. I just retired from birdhouse making. What? Yes. <laughs> Bobber, have you Bad been? timing. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, I'm going to be doing other creative endeavors. What are, What might these creative endeavors um, be? You might be making perhaps the jewelry. No, the jewelry no, no, no. It's pr it's premature to, to mention what. Okay. But um, yeah, the birdhouses, I had a good five-year run. Yeah. There's probably about 300 of them around town. And then another maybe couple hundred outside of Fairfield. <laughs> One's in Ireland, and you know they they go all over. You left your mark on the birdhouse. Uh, uh, I did, and <laughs> and then our little the little guy that makes them for us, um, he was having trouble keeping up. So we're just taking a break for about wow. a year. I wow. may do them in another year. I may not. But right now, I want to focus on other things. So how much does Bob help with making these birdhouses? <clears throat> well, on the ones that I paint, is he the one taking a break? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> On the, ones, <laughs> on the ones that I paint, he has been known to wield a drill when I can't get one of the You eyes know not to use a blowtorch, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. right, right, right. Not on the wood but when we do lines. those big Buddha birdhouses that are real yeah. huge, yeah, and yeah. then they have the Buddha statue in it, and then there's a birdhouse on the top, well, that's when Mr. Moore comes in. Construction because, mode on Yeah, he's... he's, he's gurt, gurt, and Tim and Allen, some, Tim Allen on the side. somehow we always manage to do it on a really hot day in the garage, and we're just dying. It's <laughs> a real, honest to goodness, literal blood, sweat, and tears go to oh. the boot of our houses. Have, have you been, have you, what amount of injury is there involved on those delicate, wonderful, creative hands during the process? Oh, I'm fine. I give all that stuff to him, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, not even a splinter? No, not really. Yeah. Our, the little the guy that makes them for us is a little retired guy in Oklahoma. He's mm. just you know they're beautiful. They're as smooth as a baby's bottom oh. when we get them. He just do, really. Do you do you actually you do the designs and he implement, implements what you do? Well, him. we originally we used to wholesale things, but that company went out of business. So then we found this little old retired guy in Oklahoma after some web research, and he said, "Sure, I'll do them." So he just churn out you know a whole bunch at a time for us, and um, I we kind of gave them the size that we wanted so there's a couple different sizes and then but all the design the painting designs are all mine and nice. those you know i just i get ideas for that everywhere so now speaking of ideas uh you have been sort of not the i'm I, I, you wouldn't be the overseer but you're the you're somebody who's very integral in the artistic community overseeing the um well ba back in the day first yeah. friday's art walk right fairfield first Friday's art walk yeah, I was one of the first board members. Stacy Herlin, of course, we all know, started it, and which was brilliant. She was had the vision to recognize we had a community that could support an event like that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then that after she ran it for a year and a half or so, she got as as happens with Art Walk, whoever's running it usually <laughs> accumulates a little fatigue I hear at some point. <laughs> and Burn so out, we got maybe? yeah, bur yeah. It's well, hard. Sh we don't no, 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 not, yeah, not, yeah, yeah. not in the stereotype. Yeah, of yeah. But anyway, but yeah. so then we got. Um, uh, Ed Malloy, in his infant wisdom, uh, Mayor Malloy, who had wanted a uh, Thresher's reunion type event for Fairfield, and that shows the power of Mayor Malloy, that mm -hmm. he got 12 of them a year, not just one a year. Mm -hmm. um, he got together a bunch of people, and a board of directors was, came, you know, kind of composed. And um, at some point there, I became, within, while well, I was on the board, became the volunteer executive director. Nice. And um, and our job sort of was to get its legs under it and get it stabilized. And I mean, when we took it over, we had like three hundred dollars in the bank, and it was all you know. It was sort of like we never knew from one month to the next. There was plenty of creative juice to the event, but we just we didn't know whether we'd be able to market it and all this other stuff. So we I basically spent the time 
developing relationships with the Iowa Arts Council, nice. getting the marketing going, figuring out what we could and couldn't do, you know, financially, and um, and try to get more players involved, you know, other or other organizations and right. all that. And um, so I did that for four years, and then, you know, I then I needed a rest. <laughs> and, Was somebody uh, burn out? <laughs> well, yeah, that, kind of. Yeah. Get, get oh, no, you do. You do, because anything. you really, it's it's sort of the dirty little secret of Fairfield First Fridays Art Walk is I don't think anyone who hasn't run it themselves understands fully how much work it takes. And if there was ever anything in Fairfield that needed a director, a, an executive director to be funded, you know, that is it. Because when you, if you think about all the different organizations in town, they usually have one big event that they do every year, a church or right. whatever like that. Imagine doing your one big event not just once a year, but every, every month. single month yeah. with no breaks right. and uh, expectations growing all the time. I pose the other side of that, though. My, yeah. I pose that, yeah, imagine doing that. Yes, I do imagine doing that. Yeah. Well, yes, yeah. I think every organization that's well, in town I, should be doing that. I, I know, and think of the fun that would be. I think, you know, honestly, I think that's the thing I really admire and I love about uh, uh, Friday Art Walks, yeah. that you were integral in uh, uh, helping to solidify in the community. Right? It takes with a village. Everybody who did that it, with takes you, it takes a village. a village. But that same village, there were other outlets and there were other things. I would love to see that kind of energy kind of go into some other stuff. Oh, yeah. All the time. And the Sondheim seems to have that kind of energy now, too. Yeah. And by the way, somebody sang your praises about uh, your involvement in the Sondheim for a while there, too. Didn't, uh, wasn't mm, there a little involvement there? Well, no, or, me. Right. Him. Well, Big him time. For sure. We're going to get there. Big um, time, yeah. But didn't, didn't you help out in some sort of uh, organizational way with... Uh, um, oh, whatever. It's the weather. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> Spring outside. We all want to go home. No. Which, is this exactly, which is this segue to yeah. Bob. Oh, Bob my Moore. Goodness. Bob <laughs> Moore, what are you up to these days, sir? I am approaching my 26th year anniversary at Hawthorne Direct. Oh. Next month. Yay. And so you've I'm known Hawthorne longer than Holly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, is that true? Is that true? Oh well. Wow. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah, and uh, I'm planning on retiring by the end of this year, so it's kind wow. of a, a blessing. I still love what I'm doing. Wow. Getting yeah. better and better clients. So why uh, retire? Uh, well, that's an interesting question. You want to play a little golf? You want to? You want to? No. Uh, go uh, see a concert or two uh, more. I just want to wake up in the mornings with um, with an interdirected agenda. I want to I want to wake up and see what life is like with the muses putting my to-do list together as opposed okay. to the deadlines. But there'll always be the <laughs> Always opposed to deadlines. Yeah. That's yeah. true. I mean that gets yeah. to be grating. I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, there is a certain amount of uh, tension that I carry around. My mind is fine. I don't have any, you know, uh, negative thoughts. I yeah, don't yeah, stress yeah. out in my head, but I, I carry some tension in the body. Well, and, uh, yeah. just from the constant client pressure, you're dealing with big clients. You always carry that. So, you know, I was especially wonder, their clients. Especially yeah. you're kind of right because they pay they pay decent money, yeah. and then they expect <laughs> more than oh, their decent they, money's worth of. Uh, yeah. And uh, their clients are results. used to the best of the best of everything because they're all you know big deal clients. Will you do me a favor? Can you give us the five second, uh, not history, but explanation of? It's Hawthorne Direct we're talking about and, Haw right. and Hawthorne Things. What? How did that all, you would be, I guess, one of the best experts. You in want that. the history? You get, just in a nutshell, if you don't want to. Sure, <laughs> the history, no, the history is um, uh, Ed Beckley used to uh, promote uh, no down payment real estate seminars, live seminars. Okay. Uh, when the FTC deregulated commercial time back in 84, I believe it was, uh, you were able to advertise for longer than, you know, a couple of, you know, certain number of minutes per hour. So 30 minute and 60 minute the birth of the infomercial? infomercials okay. mm -hmm. became a reality. Right. Ed uh, Beckley came up with the idea by seeing another real estate promoter's television show that he could rather than travel around the country all the time doing live things, he could do a home study course uh -huh. and sell it in a 60-minute television commercial. So was he the guy, would he, was he one of those guys that would get in front of the camera and say, like, hi, I'm Ed Beckley. Absolutely. And, yeah. Oh, this is yeah. the cheesiest kind of, no, no, you I mean, know, yeah, it's early the days of infomercial. Of yeah. Now, he is a great promoter. He was really great at this. And uh, so he 
looked up Tim Hawthorne, who was working in LA at the time. And what was Tim doing? Well, Tim uh, has a documentary background, and he also uh, did a lot of uh, news shows. I think he may have been doing You Asked For It, oh. or Real People, a segment producer back Real at that People, time. Yeah. And uh, he wanted his daughter, uh, Jessica, to grow up in somewhere else in L.A. So he took Ed up on the offer, moved here, partnered up with Ed. And uh, I worked with Tim after about the third or fourth month of the launch yeah. of the company that created the infomercials, aired them, yeah. fulfilled the product. Made uh, $160 million <laughs> in a little over a year. Now, from that, yeah. I imagine, so you were the prototype. So Hawthorne Direct was the, was the, Ed was the prototype. Uh, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. Tim because was the grandfather of the modern infomercial. That's amazing. I, you know, I, <laughs> or the father, <laughs> excuse me. Um, He'd hate father. the grandfather moniker. No, the father of the modern infomercial. The, um, uh, the god, or the godfather. <laughs> godfather. Yeah, Much he, more powerful. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I, I, was, I was involved with Razor and Tie for many years, and Razor and Tie used... I believe they used Hawthorne Direct for a while, didn't they? In addition to whatever the whatever the competitor, we won't mention him, I guess. Um, Not Razor and Tie. We always saw them, but um, Time Life. Time Life Music Time Life was, your big, oh, was oh, right, our first yeah. major client. That's right. And we did a Rick D's infomercial. Oh, that's right. For the uh, the '60s collections, which was a great hit, and yeah. uh, had a 20-year relationship with Time Life Music. Nice, fantastic. But anyway, Tim, after that. Uh, particular experience decided uh, he wanted to go into business on his own mm. and uh, started the competition used which other, other, other people's <laughs> money being an ad agency rather than investing in this yeah and uh, little by little we grew to be uh, you know a very big player in the field of uh, brands doing direct response advertising I mean nice. we've got uh, some terrific clients uh, ranging from um, Remington to J.G. Wentworth to um, Time Life, Black & Decker, uh, how do you many big ones. How do you so. fit in? Are, are you the, the overseer of a lot of stuff? No, you know, there? I've been in most every position yeah. <laughs> at Hawthorne Direct over the years. And uh, the one Have that I... Have you tried I, to drag Holly into this? Buddy? No. No, no, we, no, no. We don't work together that well. I'm the... Power behind the scenes. <laughs> Men with power. Many of the Hawthorne wives, we drive the business from our kitchens. <laughs> but right now, for the last uh, several years, um, I'm, uh, I'm leading the account management function and the strategy function. So uh, uh. we help our clients understand the strategy of putting our campaigns together, which mm -hmm. are you know, television commercial driven right. with uh, other channels integrated in online. We right. build websites, yeah. microsites, and we're branching out now into social media and some print and radio for some of our other clients. So we're yes. becoming a really full, fully integrated uh, marketing Entity, company. Market company. That's where I was going to ask you yeah. before is that how, since you've been there 26 years, you now have a sort of sense of how the industry has changed. Yeah. What are a couple of the major? Uh, we know with you know with, with social media, uh, you know everything going online, etc. That's the obvious major change that happened. But what was the slow, what was the ramp up to that? What what did you notice as far as the as far as the, the where you could the writing was on the wall? You could tell you know what we've been doing this for so we've been doing this this way very successful for, for so long. But we had better start getting in, we better start integrating yeah. these other systems. No, great question. The uh, the first big paradigm shift was. Uh, we used to, you know, make sure that the products were never offered anywhere in retail and only on television. That was the uh, big selling point. Yeah. And uh, consequently, you had to make all the money on direct sales, and there was no spillover uh, from retail sales. You couldn't account any any. You couldn't get any business from retail stores. Well, what happened was we had um, Braun came to us. B-R-A-U-N? Braun, mm -hmm. and came to us one year, gosh, you know, 20, 23 years ago maybe, maybe 22, but anyway. They had noticed that uh, their sales of their hand blenders had uh -huh. been increased at retail. And they went back and they attributed it to an infomercial was running for uh, another brand hand blender <laughs> called the Daily Mixer. Oh, you know, I vaguely remember that. <laughs> Sold by Quantum out of Philadelphia. That's funny. Right? And uh, they said, gee, you know, uh, we want to get in on the action. We've seen what another company's infomercial will do. Would you make us an infomercial? Mm -hmm. So uh, from there, 
we ran the first campaign that we're aware of, of a, whoops, sorry about the mic, <laughs> that we're aware of, um, driving retail sales, brick and mortar, in addition to direct sales. So that was paradigm shift number one. Three, that is year a big that, model. That seems to be, where, what year was that about? Like 89 or something? Uh, yeah, in yeah, that area. That sounds okay. right. 89, 90. Mm -hmm. The second big shift, of course, was uh, online ordering. It used to always be call an 800 number. Well, with the number of people that were online and shopping online, we now integrate websites into all direct response commercials as another option for ordering. What year was this around now? Well, that was uh, probably in the mid-90s. Mid-90s? Yeah. Right. Wow. Wow. I, you know, it's very hard for me to... Um, uh, considering navigating a computer was was in the way that I had on a daily basis didn't start happening really until yeah. like the mid nineties. Right. To know that websites were already being driven by a television ad makes me feel like oh boy I really was late to the game on that one. Well, um, again, right. resistance within the industry to this new idea. Why? Because they, everyone felt that it was going to delay the response. You know, direct response television is largely about impulse buying. Yeah. So the retail push. And going to a website, geez, they could get lost. They're not, you know, you pick up the phone and you have that operator selling you 10 more products, yeah, which is right. the wait, obnoxious. There's more. Obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> like, wait, well, there's I more. I use that line every day. Which is, oh, wait, there's more. <laughs> it's or obnoxious. Now. Uh, <laughs> and believe me, customers uh, wanted another option than to get pitched. So, right, you know, these days, yeah. the the biggest play is brand companies realizing that 30 second and 60 second television spots that have a call to action mm -hmm. that send them to retail stores through tagging retail locations right. and have a URL are driving more profitability and higher sales than their 15 and 30 second general ad spots on television. Mm -hmm. so, so we have accountable so advertising Accountable that's more efficient. So those mm -hmm. are the big plays, and that's why the big brands are coming to us. And and I do these. notice, I do notice there is more of the there is more uh, uh, information on commercials other than all the disclaimers that they go that go on for the majority. Oh, that's yeah. just, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. just yeah. for the drugs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank God we don't, we don't do any of those. Oh. <laughs> I love that stuff though. Can you? Yeah. Know, it was, it was, it was. Um, but, but I love, and the great, the great thing with those commercials is trying to keep up with it and, and like really paying attention to see if you can actually hear <laughs> what they're talking about. It's like, oh, okay. it's oh, you lost me on that. I just listen for death. Yeah. <laughs> that's all I listen it's for. It's always oh. there. Yeah. But it does seem like it seems like that's the natural thing where for, I'll bet you we're a year maybe at most two from seeing virtually every commercial have some sort of here's where you go online, here's where you go for... Uh, as opposed to the, like you said, it, especially if it's proven now that if you send them through this way, that's as direct as sending them to an operator to order now. Right. That's wonderful. And Hamilton yeah, yeah. Beach is on their second product with us uh, for that cool. particular model, and uh, we're very excited about that relationship. So uh, we're making a great play for accountable advertising that is more efficient than traditional. Cool. Is the bronze still, still selling? <gasps> I still you know, use it. Uh, I not love a it. Not a client of ours. <laughs> Where do I find one? I just love uh, it. I don't think they're airing right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's the best. You, you've done music, right? I've done music. Uh, well, oh, done music. I'm talking with relation to in Hawthorne. In a couple. Oh, yeah. Musical yeah, products. Well, Time, Time Life, Life music. Oh, yeah. Which was yeah. my segue into well before we could do before we do the segue into our musical conversation. <laughs> yeah. um, I, what what kinds of do you remember some of your favorite? Because uh, I want to go down memory lane too. What were some of your favorite ads? What were some of your favorite campaigns? Um, I don't think you'll be POing any of your clients. Uh, this way. It's like this is just memory. Favorite lane. campaigns, you know. I gotta say that. Uh, I mean, Time Life had some incredible. Well, those to me, collections were great. Uh, they were my <clears throat> personal favorites because of I just love that music. Uh, yeah. Honestly, no, I'm not. But trying it ranged to, every. It was everything. It yeah. was everything. Uh, I mean, there are ridiculous campaigns that we didn't do, like the Floby. <laughs> which was a, a vacuum device that pulled your hair up and then clipped it at the same time. Oh. A classic infomercial oh, God. from the archives. Oh my, that sounds dangerous. Uh, <laughs> some, of the, some of the other greats though Kids were, don't do this at home. Yeah. Were, <laughs> Ron Popeil. Oh yeah. Oh. You know, with his uh, rotisserie chop, 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 chop. and his dehydrator. 
You know, I mean, those were great in the <laughs> sense. The dehydrator. The food dehydrator. Yeah. I made you millions remember. from that thing. And it was just yeah. a pitch. It was yeah. just coming from the, from the fairgrounds and putting it on film and killing it. I really you, killing it. I bet you if we did a genealogy of every device that you're talking about, we can go right back to the... the, the Ron Papillo. That's Ron right. Go. Slice it, dice it. At least three Absolutely. degrees of separation. Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, no more than that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Take that, Kevin Bacon. Um, <laughs> bacon, another thing you could put in the slicer. Oh, yeah. Um, what, okay, so now, all right, let's get into music now. What, uh, first of all, what are you listening to these days? Come on, turn us on to some good music. Uh, you know, I... You, Mr. Concert. Well, yeah. there's a whole past, and now there's, there's about two years ago when I was aligning more closely with our daughter Mira, mm -hmm. and uh, she, you know, I'd ask her kind of her, her guidelines. She's 22 now. So okay, but you like your rock. I know you guys. I love you like my your rock. rock. You like your Americana. You like your... Yes. I love, well, I can't wait for Arcade Fire's next album, first of all. And you like your... your the, oh, the Ameri kids like. Americana. That's, that's he goes to Lollapalooza almost every year. I have with Mira. Yeah. Uh, for, I don't Where know. are you during all of this? <laughs> with the, with the, not with my the, thing. The it's not my thing. <laughs> Five of the last eight years, maybe, and yeah. now that she's graduating, that won't be happening much because I, I we do need each other to, <laughs> at Lollapalooza <laughs> to find each other. <laughs> Father, <laughs> daughter. I do. But uh, there's Watch so I really I love you know, I love all kinds. I love jazz. You know the old stuff, Coltrane and uh, the classics. Yeah. And uh, uh, what, what's the latest jazz that you've been listening to? Uh, uh, I'm something? still. I haven't got a lot of new stuff I'm listening to. I'm wide open to new. There's some bizarre uh, new album that I've listened to, and I say bizarre only not from the music. Music isn't bizarre, but how this came about. There's a little girl, 11 years old, Emily Bear, uh, and. I interviewed her uh, yesterday, day before yesterday, something like that. Cutest thing, cute, she's the cutest thing in the world. She's a protege of Quincy Jones. Oh my god. Quincy, gosh. she's been writing music. She's one of these proteges. She's been writing music since she was three years old. Mm -hmm. um, Quincy has been mentoring her for about two years, ever since she was guesting. She guested on the Ellen DeGeneres show. And it's like, what? <laughs> what? I don't know how this can possibly happen. You know, in a pop culture, anything can happen, I guess. But yeah. on the other hand, uh, you know, I was like, okay, got to listen to this. This 11-year-old. I'm not really expecting very much. I put the thing on. Now, granted, Quincy Jones is producing. Yeah. Right. But I'm, I'm trying to hear through what he's added. He, mm -hmm. He's a producer. So he's added all this, the lushness, the strings. Mm -hmm. You know how to players. read all that, too. Yeah. Or exactly. So it's like, yeah, we have to listen to years of demos, having <laughs> right. to hear through, like, you know, some things. Like, Where's the artist here? Right. Yeah. <laughs> but but, but um, I listened to this album. Uh, I think it's called, it's called Diversity. Uh, and... It was amazing. She was really wow. pretty cool. Now, I'm sure she had a lot of guidance. Two years working with Quincy Jones, you're going to be good, no matter who you are on the planet, I believe. Um, but she really was way beyond 11 years old. I mean, I guess we had, what's her name, too? Church. Um, yeah, Charlotte yep. Church. Charlotte, Charlotte Church. Church. We yeah. had younger artists who were amazing. Mm -hmm. But this girl but church is didn't unexplainable. Compose. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. And She's this, just this a girl great. is unexplained. She's and she just a great. On this. Yeah. She just plays piano. Oh, and I okay. asked her a question. I said, "What do you, you know? What do you do for fun? You know?" And she yeah. swims. We talked about swimming. We talked <laughs> about all sorts of stuff yeah. other than uh, other than just music. And uh, she just seemed to be the most normal, other than being Did a, a musical genius. Did her parents do a lot of music? I mean, were her parents really into music? Or? Uh, her mother or? allowed. No, uh, that wasn't the story that I got. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But I did really, I, I focused on her. I wanted to see how, I wanted her to be comfortable during the conversation, during the phone call. Yeah. And I, I, so I was talking about all those things that she liked. And yeah. she liked all the normal things every other kid likes. Yeah. And remember the old days? It's like in the days of classical pro, uh, 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 you know, the uh, what prodigies. Do you call prodigies. Yeah, yeah. Classical prodigies where you would, the kid would be totally, totally egghead, totally yeah. abnormal yeah. Uh, forever. And the yeah. parents would be like, you know, totally, get back to the piano. Right. <laughs> but right. mom, I, well, I yeah. need to use the rest of the piano. That's yeah. right. Um, Musical geeks. Actually. Musical yeah. geeks. Yeah. Though it, against it's, their will. Against their will. Yeah. But maybe, thank God, maybe we've learned a few things since those days. Yeah. But on the other <laughs> hand, that's sort of the stereotype of yeah. a genius pro a, a, yeah. a prodigy. Um, well, she was nothing like that. Genius mm. often does come at the cost of balance in life. Yeah. So it's refreshing to hear a yeah. young person like yeah. that who's gifted in one area in such a great way yeah. and still want to go swimming and see your friends and all that kind of stuff. So, Did we have prodigies in Fairfield? Now let's get to Fairfield for a second. Sure. Do we have some prodigies as you guys were, you know, uh, growing with the town and getting to know all the families here? Were you guys watching some of the kids here and going, 
Oh, wow. Yeah, that kid's... Oh, yeah. That's an amazing kid. That's an amazing kid. Uh, there's been certainly musical prodigies. Yeah. Um, Ike? Uh, who's the piano player uh, that's so... There's a kid who went to New York that everybody likes. You mean Keelan Dimmick? Keelan. Oh, yeah. Ke yeah. Yeah. Was he a, was he, was he a foreseeable well, prodigy? Uh, well, he's a wonderful pianist right. yeah. and, a, and a great musician. Prodigy is a really tough he, category. He wasn't yeah. early on. Yeah. It wasn't, <laughs> I don't know yeah. that it was early on for Keelan. He, he's um, our daughter's grade level. And, and I don't know that he, he may have been taking lessons when they were you know, all young together. Yeah. But I think he really broke out after he you know, yeah. started in a few the years prodigy ago. Prodigy comes to mind. Eric Herlin. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Eric, Eric Herlin. Yes, on yeah. Fairfield 2.0. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Blows yes. me away yeah. Yeah. with his talent. It's like, where's that coming from? Just yeah. blows me away. Eric, we love you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, uh, he's in that category. He really is amazing. Easily for me. Yeah. I, uh, okay, Eric Herlin. Uh, uh, take the word prodigy away. Uh, um, and, and yes, gifted. you guys are gifted. You saw all the gifted kids that came through here, that grew up here. I have a theory. Yeah. I have a new theory on this three yeah. years into this now. Yeah. Okay. Um, that didn't dawn on me until the other day when I was, I forgot how it came up in conversation, but because there isn't a strong, I've always felt that there's a relationship, a synergy n n between a, a person and some outward event, whether it be sports, whether it be writing, whether it be whatever. Or a in mentor. This, well, let's get um, you yeah, know. Let's okay. okay or mentors. Yeah. We've had we've had a few in the town I, as oh, I've heard from history. Oh my goodness! Okay. Yeah. Now that aside, though, it seems like because there wasn't such a strong, really strong, other than tennis, we we don't really have a very strong sports community. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. right. When the kids were growing up here, mm -hmm. what did you do to play? What did you do to challenge each other? It almost seems like that's how music became like well, the, the other arts language. Too. Music yeah, the and other, the other arts. And yeah. the other arts. Okay. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. But, very arts friendly. Yeah. And that's environment. Why, and that's why when I was surprised how many. Oh my God! It's like all these kids, all these really talented kids. What are they doing in one place like I this? And I was shocked by it initially. Uh, but I think that might be why. I think that's because it became their language. And then when they stay, it's because it's so much more affordable to be an artist here than it is yeah, out there. Yeah. I mean, they do go yeah. away, but I most of them rubber band. Away. Most. Well, I need. I agree. Don't you think they oh, all need absolutely. to go away so they can experience the world? If part they want of, to come back, come back. Part but. of living in Fairfield is knowing when to get the heck out. <laughs> so <laughs> love and, your Fairfield. So they but need, yeah, this love is good Fairfield. for the kids. No, but it's good. They need to do the whole rubber band thing and go out for a while and mm -hmm. and uh, you know as the expression goes, bleach the cloth and come back in and. Uh, and we hope they come back in. Hopefully yeah. when they start breeding, they'll all be back, you know, and <laughs> they have their babies here. Well, we're and, seeing yeah. it. We're, <laughs> we're seeing a lot of that, uh, musicians <laughs> and, and business people. But like you, I am totally pumped about the musical talent. I can name here. you. I mean, just off the top of my head, I can name you people that I've, I've now even worked with. Joey Del Rey, I think, is, is an oh, amazing yeah. uh, kid. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, let's throw names out there. Joseph Mayfield, who came from another place, uh, settled here right. and, and and started doing music with the Rabelais right. and Joe uh, oh, Joey and yeah. it's like who is this kid and in the well, year that he has been d doing music yeah. he went from somebody who was a little bit challenged as far as hearing pitch and, and etc yeah. to being somebody that I would feel very comfortable going to see knowing he's going to put on an amazing concert that's great uh, that, yeah. was, that was just I a year I thought of Emily Poole Emily Poole yeah um, and, um, Darla of Rock, Paper, Scissors. Oh, my gosh. Darla, of course, and Gemma Cohen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Johnny Cohen. Not to leave oh, yeah. anyone out. Not to leave anyone out. Like the whole out. Cohen family. David, we have da we the have entire David Cohen family. We're not going to upset people, I yeah. hope, but we're just, we're just <laughs> thinking exactly. under this pressure situation of all, all the great <laughs> musicians we can. I know, I know, I know. Uh, this is oh, the oh, Academy the Rosses. We've got the Rosses. Right. We have Lane Weaver. We have, there are just, Lane we haven't heard from in a while. Lane, what are you doing? Arthur, <laughs> Arthur Lee Land, I just thought Lynn, was. Now he in, I know, I know. Colorado, maybe. but yeah. his presence was felt and his contribution was. Yeah, big he made a great contribution with the kids. I thought. Nice. Yeah. What about um, what about before Arthur? Because Arthur was here for a certain amount of time, but it wasn't terribly long. In terms of well, who see, helped the kids? See, I'm thinking less about music ah, and thinking yeah. more about other things like the performing arts and like okay, Rodney yes, Franz. Yes. He wants to switch out of music. Yes. That's good. No, well, with I us. do. Rodney <laughs> Franz um, yeah. and all oh, those that's kids. Right. That's right. Who, with the, as far as uh, and and they're doing it again now with yeah. one of his students. Um, Colin? Is it Colin? Yeah. I love Colin. You know, <laughs> but Rodney, what Rodney would what do great... with these kids and and the brilliant performances that came. I mean, like way beyond high school level, like Jeff Boothby doing, Jeff Boothby. Uh, he did this, well, I don't know Another the name of it, guest on he had something like four telephones, I forget the name of it, and he did, oh. it was like 45 yeah. minutes or an hour long, and it was 
all his dialogue, wow. answering phones and going back. I can't. I wish I can remember the piece. <laughs> but see, that's like Rodney France's influence on those kids. And now Jeff is like a great filmmaker and yes. you know doing all this wonderful stuff. All the with videos that. for the local yeah. for the local bands and beyond, and he does all that photography. Absolutely. Uh, he's just and he's he's now international. They hire yeah, him for weddings absolutely. and stuff around the world. All around the world because um, he puts together great wedding videos. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> and then maybe Ace, for our 25th and, wedding anniversary, Jeff should do a video for us. Uh, well, I'm open to that. Yeah. Jeff, are you listening <laughs> here? <laughs> Contact. Here's the contact. Um, like an infomercial. Yeah. <laughs> Which this right. has sort of been a little bit. No, I, 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 I just, I do love this. I love the kids in this community. I didn't, uh, and I really didn't, uh, I haven't gotten a grip on how to turn the corner on even sending them out to the world to people I know or et cetera. You mm -hmm. know, not me allegedly having contacts in the music business. Mm -hmm. I have whatever. But even sending them out it's hard to know what is going to happen out there. For instance, Johnny Cohen. We, I, I well, got into Atlanta. Well, everything's changed. Yeah. I yeah, mean, yeah. are our yeah. paradigms even relevant for these kids anymore? Well, I mean, you have a That's million right. contacts. That's right. You have a million See? contacts, but at the same time, it's sort of, it's like there's all these other things with social media in play and all That's this right. other stuff. So what do we know? <laughs> I have been so, no, but I have been so, look at what I, do. I mean, because of a certain reason, we won't go into that, yeah. I started asking the question, uh, what advice do you have for new artists? Yep. Because Good. I had a specific goal in that one. Now, I mean, I kind of have always been like that. I've always loved working with new artists, and mm -hmm. that's a tradition because my mentor, Tommy West, used to do that when he mm -hmm. started with new labels and all that. He would always be a, a whole roster of new yeah. artists all the time. It's yeah. just an exciting thing. Yeah. There, nobody's an egomaniac yet. You know, it's just right. a lot of fun when, as you're trying to build the project, build the, the identity, et cetera. Nowadays, uh, seriously, if you try to help any of the kids, and I lo like I'm saying, you hear, you're hearing the love, and, mm -hmm. and, and Adrian, and all these people, oh, yeah. you throw stuff out there, they don't really know what to make of it, because they don't come from our world. They don't come from that era of that paradigm. So, so in other words, like, like Johnny, sending Johnny to Atlantic Records, was like, oh, let's get him an internship. It's like, oh, that'll change his life. That'll get him a whatever. <laughs> you know, you go there, and you hang out, and you learn what you can about the I music know. business, but... It isn't. It isn't in the context of this. Will this? This is now my next step in life. It's more like okay. This is more information. It, I'm you getting. know, I just That's think. Right. I just Whereas think in the past it used to be yeah. you needed to do that in order to get to the next goal I for your life. I think it's completely different for these kids. Social media. One of the things. Yeah. That's it. One of the things that was great for us when our daughter went to college. Um, they had a great parents orientation. I think a lot of schools do that, and they gave us a reading list of books. And the book that one of the books that was recommended was this book called Born Digital. Mm. And it was sort of my first, aha. Uh -huh. mm. My kid, who's 22 now, never lived in this world without the internet. Mm. And just what that means. And this book is great, just talking about mm -hmm. how that works out in their lives, how that works out with their opportunities, how they're going to make their living. And it's, I, you know, I just think it's going to be really, really different. And it'll be up to us, you know, boomers, you know, to sort of Oh, drag them down. No. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> drag them down. Drag them down with Why us, kids. I don't know what to do. You do it and you'll be successful. Uh, you jettison us as soon as you possibly <laughs> yeah, can. I know, kids. Really, I know. <laughs> don't even look at us. Go you may have the, the opportunity grade. through lack of health care. <laughs> see what happens. But and yeah, the really. Oh, gosh. Oh, yeah. No. All right, we, we won't go there. there. No, but, the funny but, thing is, we will. Say, the one thing I do want to say, oh, well, hadn't you brought it up? Oh, oops, <laughs> here we go. Never mind. We're not going to go anywhere, but I just want to say I have been so grateful. You know, being and speaking of social media, so yeah. we have a little seg here. Right. Um, I have been so grateful to see your comments on Facebook because you've been orienting. I will put, I will watch orienting. some of these things go up on Facebook, and I've been quite verbal on this show about my opinions. We're not going to get into your opinion. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but it's just as far as my opinions I think with we stuff share like a lot the president. I uh, read exactly <laughs> the horrible things that were said during the, and also the thing about women. Uh, all of these things that came out in the elections, and I'm looking at that and I'm going. This is Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> this I thought would be a little more progressive or a little more at least um, level-headed. Yeah. Than than you know because the, the the kids are on here. social media. It wasn't the kids that were doing it. It was the it was the, the oh, creepy yeah. grown-up uh, stalkers, the creepy whatever you want stalkers. to call them, <laughs> that were adding this this ridiculous you know these these like uh, what was it the um, the uh, uh, you know those theories conspiracy theories and things like that. Oh like, right. You know, I'm watching this and then right. the, the thing with the women. I mean the Dove commercial. Oh, and no, is that no, what you're talking about? No, no, no there was, but like, the there was oh, like, just politics. Yeah, just politics in yeah. general. Well, the whole you know. Although I thought the Dove commercial like was was very interesting. Well, it's the one uh, just to in, to in case anyone hasn't seen it. Um, it was it's done by Dove Soap, and it's kind of a feel good piece, and you don't even really know it's about Dove Soap. I think there's something down in the corner, you know, their logo or something. But basically, they take a, a, a criminal sketch artist who sits down, and a, a woman comes in, and they can't see each other. 
and he just starts asking her questions to describe herself. And then he sketches according to what she's saying. And then they have someone who knows her come in, and again, no one can see each other, and he starts asking the same questions about the other woman, and, and then they describe it. And the two sketches turn out to be quite different, one very attractive, and then the other one, you know, pretty much any flaw a woman can perceive in oneself is exaggerated in the, in the original thing. That was from the self-perception? From the self-perception, self self yeah. And the message was, hmm. you know, don't be so self-critical, because yeah. guess what? Beautiful. Yeah, you know. Hmm. But it was interesting to me, because... We saw it, and I thought, oh, this is, this is great, and all that. And then, then we get this feedback from our daughter and a number of people her age going, this sucks. And she had all these reasons. Just first of all, you know, her overriding one was, is it's all skinny white women that are on that commercial. <laughs> you know, there's no diversity, you know. They're all of, the, of about the same age and all this other stuff. And then there's been this whole debate going on now since then on blogs and what have you about the value of that, what's wrong with that commercial and everything else. But generally speaking, it just seems like the 20-somethings have a completely different set of objections about that hmm. than we do. Well, and it, which, I, which, again, I just see playing into this whole generational thing that they, they are just wired differently. They're wired differently, but, they, but the, on the other hand, we wired them very similar to us. And, and, and I'll give you an example. They like our music. They like they kind of have some of the, the some of the expressions that we we've taken with us over the years. They kept some of that stuff. They didn't just jettison everything. You're when right, they, Mike. When they We're not separation. totally useless, but <laughs> <laughs> no, we gave but, some. No, but it was beautiful. No, no, no. But think about that. I don't know very. But they're I don't selective. Know any other generations. They're very, very. But but they're very selective they love, about it. They are okay. Yeah. I'm serious. Yeah. Don't you think? Think about it. But They're I very think they selective. accepted us. They accepted us on, on a different kind of level than a lot of like the 80s kids and a lot of the, even yeah, the, the 90s, the flannel true. generation, the grunge kids. They did, they accepted us differently. Yeah. They, I think they, I think they, they kind of liked Hendrix. They kind of liked Led Zeppelin. They kind of liked well, that's Beatles very, or whatever. But that's like ancient history for them. Of course But it was they a unifying, like, it was ancient well, history true. for them, yeah. but a unified, well, I didn't like well, I mean, now I appreciate because I'm older. You didn't like Dean Martin? You I'm didn't so, like yeah. Andy Williams? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Although but, I did have the Love Story album when I was a kid. My oh. mom had it. Um, but I'm just saying, I, exactly, I didn't have an association with my... I did with my mother because it was music, the general concept right, of music. Right, right, But I didn't like those records. I, I right. discovered music on my own with The Fifth Dimension and I think uh, and Eric Clapton or something, or uh, no, the Allman Brothers. Uh, there were things that happened in my life, Partridge Family, of course. There were yeah. things that happened in my life which were which did which totally separated me from my parents generation we use computers we're starting we have we are we object we 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 get into it kicking and screaming supposedly i mean mm -hmm. that's the that's supposedly the, the the rap on our demo but on the other hand we do turn the corner Mm -hmm. We turn the corner and we get into it, and then it's kind of fun. And then you can't get us off of Facebook, and thus the lurkers that I was talking about with <laughs> these creepy things about yeah. Second Amendment rights and all this. Yeah, stuff. yeah. So um, I, uh, I, I feel like that's why we may have our best. This was the generation that bonded with us the best out of out of any of them. Well, and yet they, their gen, and they, their separation yeah. is still painful. It's still, it's yeah, still yeah, yeah. Us yeah us. Well, like, you know, they bonded with us to a point. We're part of the mix, you know, and then they crowdsource. You know, naturally, <laughs> yeah. all their other life lesson packages. Yeah. yeah. Seriously. Yeah. So we're yeah. part of the mix. We're the one on one part of the mix, and yeah. then the rest is crowdsourced one through on peers. One in your face. Peers through yeah. peers. Yeah. To be accepted which is really. You we know, do that it, too, but it, it doesn't uh, seem like as much. Not <laughs> right. nearly. No, but as look much. at their peers like go mob. way yeah. Yeah. outside the boundaries of where you're living. And I mean, remember, our That's peers right. were That's like. Right. Whoever we grew physically. up with and all that, yeah. their peers are everybody on the planet. Everybody on the internet on the planet. Yeah. 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 What uh, What would you say if you were to if you were to? <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. Careful. What advice would you give Mira at this? Way? No. Yeah. What advice What oh, advice would you Mira. give What advice would you give parents who are in the situation was like I don't know what to do. I uh, you've had a great. Well, you, it depends how old. Oh, old depends on how old, old they are. Let's say the kid is anywhere between, <laughs> and I'm going to be listening very carefully. To, let's say the kid is anywhere between 17 and like 25. Myelination, you know, all that stopping at 25. So you have to give. You always have to give them the benefit of the doubt till. I'm going to shift your age thing. I'd say oh, from then. about 15 to oh. about 22, 21. Okay. And mm. I would say what worked for us was we realized the uh, keeping the relationship open was the most important thing. More than boundaries. Boundaries, More than boundaries. stop working yeah, boundaries at stop a certain working. age. Yeah. Yeah. The boundaries are important to instill the fundamentals. Yeah. And without them, that's a problem. So but up, up to a certain age, I maybe think a when they turn like girls, maybe I freshman think. in high school, something like that, um, or even before. Because the boundaries are going to be broken. 
And uh, you, just have, you can't control it, and you yeah. have to resign yourself. And the main thing is that you figure preserve, out a way that you preserve the relationship. to preserve the relationship, yes. yeah. build the trust, yeah. so that there's an open communication, yeah. and you're you're not, um, you know, there's not a lot of secrets. And uh, sometimes it takes a a big event mm -hmm. uh, to break that uh, no secrets thing, uh, mm -hmm. or you know, which happened. To us, and uh, we've got a very open relationship with our daughter. Yeah, I luckily, find that I, luckily, I find that the, yeah. I find that the kids who have the most trust and honesty with their parents, regardless of whatever it is, have had the best outcomes that I know of. Mm. Uh, and the more repressive, or the more, how come you're doing? Yeah, the scolding, well, the scolding. Well, the know, way we were, the yeah. way a lot of us were raised as boomers, you know, and my, as Catholics. Yeah, oh yes, Catholics. Yeah. <laughs> my way or the highway. Yeah. I because say jump. I, you ask because how I said high. So. Because, because I said so. Because I said so. Always so not. Like, Dad, not, you're in the room with me now. Yeah, it, it just doesn't. It just. It wasn't. <laughs> do as I it, say. Well, let me. Do. I can't speak for everyone. It just wouldn't work for us. It just didn't work for us, and it didn't work for a lot of, you know. The our one friends. side story I'll have to tell about our, our differences in parenting oh, yeah. in the earlier days, <laughs> yes. uh, and we won't we, talk about this much I more. I was a little but, more conservative than Bob, uh, as I think many of She moms was more are. conservative yeah. when, when Holly said no about something. There was no reversing because you don't want to weaken it, and right, you don't right, want right. to go right. to dad and kind of turn one against the other. Right. But in an open way, with Holly in front of, I would say, Mira, um, my style is if you come up I might say no as a reaction sometime, <laughs> just right. an emotional reaction. Right. And if you come up with a good logical reason right. why that no doesn't make any sense, I'll consider changing that. And I, you can hear through a con. We have a girl that is a kick mm, negotiator right now. Excellent. She yeah. knows how yeah, to do it. <laughs> she actually wrote down a note of why I should get the master bedroom. She wanted she to take the master bedroom from us. us. Yeah. <laughs> was it a good argument? When she was... Uh, Fifteen. Very good. It's a great argument. It's a great argument. Did she get it? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't. We didn't have to explain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when it gets down to it, we're not using logic here. We like the yeah. room. No. Yeah. <laughs> it's our room. Yeah. That is so cool. Um, uh, beautiful. And I, from everything you you tell me, everything I hear about Mira and all that, you, everything is just a beautiful. Everything is a, a, a sweet. Everything. And not they all lived happily ever after, but it's really sweet to hear the stories and all we're, that. And you're such a devoted. She's my guru. Constantly going. <laughs> There, yeah, actually, our that. children are our gurus She's for sure. Oh, guru. I think most children are gurus for parents because, you know, everything that was unresolved in your own childhood, it's going to come <laughs> boiling up in some way, shape, or form, and what have you. But I mean, she comes yeah. back to me and says, "Dad, you're projecting." Yeah. <laughs> it's great stuff. <laughs> she started that when she was 15. She started saying stuff One of the one like of the that. interesting, one of the funny things, one of the cute <laughs> things that happened was when I was mentoring a certain kid. He threw back on me one time. This is passive aggressive. I went, "How right. do you know what that means?" By the way, it's not passive aggressive. <laughs> yeah. but okay, good try. <laughs> that was very cute. Anyway, um, it was. Yeah. I, uh, I, I'm so glad you came on the show. We talked about so much stuff, and we went way over time, which is okay. Um, Got more hours in the can. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> the three-part episode. Yeah. Um, but uh, I'm not going to – you won't be able to come back to Fairfield 2.0. I was going to say, come on back to Fairfield 2.0 anytime, but be, you're not going to be able to. It's going to be 3.0. Because it's going to be 3.0. Is this the last right. one oh, of 2.0? Uh, not sure. I don't want to. Do, I'm, okay. We'll probably have a special okay, going okay. away party yeah, type yeah, thing for yeah. that. Although you're the second to last. Okay. And wow. I do appreciate. Uh, I, I appreciate your friendship. I appreciate your musical sharing, your musical knowledge and ex enthusiasm. And passion. Yeah. We have to go and passion. We have to go to more concerts together. We have to do stuff. We do. Oh, yeah. yeah. Lucinda Williams, a high point. It was a high point. It was a high point. Thank you. Edward Sharp, Magnetic, Magnetic Zeros. Playing in Des Moines. Let's go. All right. Yeah. I'm, going, I'm going to again. Des Moines tonight, by the way. Call me hippies right. again. <laughs> I, yeah. I just got a new, thank you, Dustin and Linda. I just got a new, um, I work for a, an online, uh, an online uh, school. I'm the voice of the teacher for a lot of courses. Oh. So they got me a computer based on I've been having a lot of problems with the setup that I have. It's not, it's just not the best. So they said, it's time to upgrade. And they just gifted me. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so I'm, I'm off to uh, Apple. Uh, oh, which, oh, which get yourself all I have it together. Wonderful. Fairfield, you need an Apple. For the yeah. type of people that are here, we need an apple here. Maybe we can oh, attract a store? an apple store here. Oh, we need an apple so store here. So we can here. camp out on the sidewalk the next time they release a new phone. <laughs> shorter, right. lines. Yeah, shorter lines. Shorter lines, I guess. You're getting a tent. Can I go pro? 
Uh, they got me a MacBook Pro. A and MacBook they, and Pro, they, and I'm getting an, I'm getting gifted with an iPad. My oh, first my. next week. That is so wonderful. And you did Thank that you without invested. selling their Face Congratulations. cream. Congratulations. Way to go. <laughs> <laughs> what? I heard about this. Uh, do you need to talk? Do you want to talk? You want no, a three thank second you. thing on No, that? thank you. All right. Um, <laughs> I love you people. And uh, you, you people. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it don't at least, you at least you guys. <laughs> at least say you guys. <laughs> I just yeah. bet I do. You were, my you were a couple of my first friends when I got here. And I really appreciate it. I know. Uh, we've been lucky we've that way. And we love everything that you're doing for the community. And mm -hmm. for, for that. And that you youth, stayed. Really. I know. It what was happened? tenuous was for a while. <laughs> well, you <laughs> well, you didn't notice the chain on the yeah. back. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get that ball off. The chain is like yeah. in the car with that. That happens to a lot of people. Yeah, we can't leave. There's you no way leave. we're leaving. Oh. I've been here since 75. Yeah. Why go? You've been here since 75. And what's the, we're not done yet. Yeah. What, what is the, uh, what is the, you got here from 75. And here we are in 2013, I hope. Yeah. Um, by the time this show airs, I'm hoping that <laughs> yeah. um, What is the biggest, what are a couple of the biggest changes oh. that you've noticed from getting here to right now? Uh, well, the common vision of the community from the leadership of the community mm -hmm. at Malloy, totally responsible for putting it out there and setting a great example. Um, to me, uh, you know, and I became committed to, quote, unifying the community um, early on uh, after Ed lost the first election. Uh -huh. I became, uh, my first community service, passion came up because I, I saw the value of finding common ground and coming together. And just from that um, point of view that Ed put out there and the vision of what the beauty is and the unique selling proposition of mm -hmm. this community is yeah. from the outside. Uh, the tourism trade, it's uncannily growing. And to me, that's huge. The sustainable living thing is uh, beautiful. You get another reason why Fairfield the, could yeah. be on the Yeah, I mean, we've always had the arts community and always had the university, but we needed more to make this a truly sustainable, economically stable and growing community. I and I want to oh, based ahead. on yeah. a very strong um, native population and appreciation for the history. Because That's honestly, Fairfield yeah. is always it, I don't know what it is about this little point on the planet, but it has always been a center of innovation and what have you. That's from, where I from, switched. From, first from, library. Yeah. We had the first library. Yeah. Right? Well, that and loud yeah. manufacturing. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it just changed farming. You first know? Carnegie Library, West. Carnegie and, and, yeah, I mean, there's a lot first of. First library, not the first. <laughs> first <laughs> golf back course, to Egypt, West <laughs> Mississippi, first state fair. We've got a lot of firsts. But no, it's, Fairfield's always been really blessed that way. Um, if you read the history of it, which I highly recommend. Yeah. You know, great yeah, yeah, book, yeah. A, uh, Fairfield, A. Fairfield. By yeah. what's her last? Is it Welty? I can't yeah, remember. Welty. Anyways, Seems read like that. I read that a bunch of times. To Fairfield 2.0, perhaps. Well, yeah. whatever. That's true. No, no. You are kind of almost essentially doing what she did in the book. She, you know, this woman just took wow. it and went, "All right, we need to get this history down." And in very antiquated language, she she accomplished that. It is sweet. I mean, whether it be rag rye or whether it be whatever's going on at the Sondheim, whatever whatever's going on in the square, whatever, all of this. This has been a nice run for this, the, the type of show this was so far. I've, I've enjoyed it. it. It was originally when in the beginning I used to go, this is about, this is of Fairfield to Fairfield, from Fairfield, yeah, <laughs> et cetera. Yeah. And I really, and now and initially started with musicians because I had that, I had more of a relationship with them in the beginning right. in the community. But as I brought more and more people on here, it oh, became an evolving story, and it was really, really so beautiful. So many and fun people. I'm doing. hope. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you so much for saying what you said. That is one of the biggest compliments I think ever. Uh, hmm. Anybody who's been watching some of these shows, <laughs> I, I know you can't catch all of them, but I think you can see there's like it's a love. Jason is going. Yeah, yeah. Jason is, I, I I've watch seen all, all of them. All, <laughs> every single one. By the way, I, I, oh, through the patient man through all of these is Jason Strong. Thank you very, very, very much, Jason. 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 Thank you for the show and the community. The community. You're all. You're there with your camera whenever something's yeah. going on. We won't bang our mics too much for you. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe we will. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, seriously, it's been, a it's been a beautiful experience learning about the town from the town when they were here, talking to me and telling mm -hmm. me about it. Because mm -hmm. I'm always, you know, I'll throw some supposition out there and they're like, no, that's no, <laughs> no, you're no. wrong. <laughs> like, Fairfield's, oh, okay, fine. Fairfield's just me. been really lucky. I mean, ever since it was started. I mean, the whole immigration issue with the you know campus moving here, mm -hmm. you know, Richard Florida hadn't written his book yet to know that it there were a bunch of cultural creatives that were essentially moving in, you know. Cultural creatives. But nice basically, um, it's kind of worked really well for all of us. And that was just yet another, in my mind, um, 
a great demonstration of people embracing change and diversity. You yeah. know, not everyone always can go at the same pace. That's right. And there are still always still that group that will, you know, be dragged along kicking right, and screaming right, right. it, but there's always that group that's like really embracing it and then most people are like, "Okay, this sounds good. I'll go for it." Yeah, exactly. And what I was going to say earlier also to your point about there's always been this community in that community, yeah. but there was also the local people who were here. The local oh, people, yeah. the integration as I uh, as we were talking <clears throat> with Mike Halley and uh, and Malloy, all sorts of people about this, the integration of all of the groups into one community yeah. is seamless now to me. Yeah. I don't, I don't yeah. see prejudice. I don't see anything. Well, I see there's a little. There always will be. Well, but, there's grumble, but, but there's grumbling is, as, as backbiting happens between is, humans. This is a Midwest town, too. I mean, you know, <laughs> well, it's just and, the way it is and, in any and, Midwest town. And to town. me, that's more <laughs> yeah, a sign I, I, of people being passionate about their corner. Right, right, right. And and that passion is great. Well, sometimes religion can come in, can be a thing, or sometimes or sometimes right. somebody's so much belief less. for so... I, yeah, that's the so point much is less than it was back in the day. Exactly. I think the point is that everybody can sort of believe what they want to believe, do what they want to do, yeah. and they're all living in the same community together, and that's the seamlessness yeah. that I'm seeing, and I yeah. love it. I and love the, that. And the events that I see that brought things together were um, uh, Little League, uh, working mm -hmm. together on Little League. Girl Beautiful. Scouts. Girl Boy Scouts. Scouts. Boy Scouts? And yeah. the Sondheim Center yeah. were, to me, oh, unified yeah. community where the trust built, yeah. where you're just kind of elbow to elbow working for well, a common passion. Well, nice. the first couple of things nice. we mentioned have to do with our children. Yeah. And I think that's right. one thing everyone can agree on. Right. The children are our future. <laughs> Let's start <laughs> singing. <laughs> Did we have a global warming carbon tax show sometime? Yeah, I'm all about that. But, <laughs> that's Square Field 3.0. Yeah, I know. All right, we'll have you back. All right. But back. anyways, um, but we, we have a lot of common ground. And what I love is, is that everyone's leaning more into their common ground than they are the differences. Nice. Good one. What do you what what's on your horizon immediately? What are you up to? Immediately meaning what is your plan for even the year or whatever, other than retirement? <laughs> uh, retirement well, I'm 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 gearing up for retirement, so to speak. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Learning how to cook. Uh, is he ever gonna get there? Learning how to oh, cook. Oh yeah. Oh he's a great cook. Getting hobbies. No, not the cook. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sure he'll be a great well, cook. We'll see. It's what gonna happens. happen. Yeah, yeah but uh, Don't you dare. You, you need starting that. to cook. Became a vegan on Christmas and uh, <laughs> enjoying that. And back to my leather craft of making belts. And uh, I used to, you know, have a leather shop back in the early '70s. And uh, wow. so I'm back that getting kind of hobbies lined up in case. Uh, I need a reason to get out of bed after I'm retired, right? So, uh, <laughs> creating a few. <laughs> I'm sensing, and the concerts, the concerts are not going to go know, watch themselves. They watch themselves. Um, uh, I see a little artistic thing happening with the belts and all those. We've been, our family's very blessed because all three of us are extremely visual and love the arts. We're Merit's very, yeah. yeah, our daughter, Bob, myself, we just love the arts. And boy, did, are we lucky that we live in Fairfield. But, hmm. yeah, so I'm getting ready to turn a corner with my art and... Um, and get my daughter graduated <laughs> <laughs> and launch her on her next adventure. Congratulations. Then, How long does she have? Uh, she, I think her last class is... Today. May oh have been today, gosh. yeah. Oh, my gosh. You know, so now I'm, she's just doing critique week. She's, <clears throat> she's an art major as well at School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and she's doing all her critiques now. So, uh, But Johnny, class is over. Johnny Cohen. Johnny Cohen had his last That's concert. That's right, yeah. We Inter saw, yeah, yeah. See if I, you saw the, my silly pictures that I got. Oh, no, I know. It's, it's a good <laughs> way to keep track 80. of the Fairfield family. <clears throat> well, I'll tell you, the, the, the only, I guess the only indication really that I like, kind of like Fairfield, is that I was on Route 80 and I'm going, I know where Route 80 goes. It goes east. Yeah. <laughs> I know where this I goes. I don't know. I think you asked that question. And we said, yes, well, it depends on where <laughs> you are. Yes, if you're in Des <laughs> the Quad Cities or Des Moines, you could be going any direction. Well, that was an endless loop. That's right. <laughs> Uh, all right, again, let's do the double goodbye. Uh, yeah. Thank you very, very much for being on here. I love you guys so much. And uh, Thank and you. Come here, you big thank guy. Thank you. Um, Congratulations on a great 2.0 season. Thank you. And, um, yeah, who knows what 3.0 will be like. Yeah. Uh, but uh, hang in there and definitely be a guest on that as soon oh, as we sure. figure out what that is. We're open. This show has to end sometime, but yeah. we can start another one. Yeah. All right. <laughs> it's a movie that together. together. What did you uh oh, we're dating ourselves. <laughs> no, no, it was this. Oh, uh, I'm looking for me. It's the nose. <laughs> oh, God. That was a little more fun. obvious. Whatever, whatever. Way Carol too Burnett much reference. Here. All right. Uh, <laughs> no. All right. See you at the next concert. Great. Thanks. All right. Bye, Fairfield. Bye, Hang everybody. Lucky Fairfield, you are watching Fairfield 2.0. And let me tell you, Tom Jones is our next guest. And uh, let's just welcome him and, him and get into this record here. Tom, how are you doing? Welcome to Fairfield. Uh, thanks, Mike. 
<laughs> Tom, uh, you have a new album, a wonderful new album. I'm just going to come right out and tell you my opinion of it. Spirit in the Room. Uh, it's a, it, what's my favorite thing about this record is that you take these, you take songs by many artists, for instance, Bob Dylan, Paul Simon, um, uh, your Tom Waits cover is amazing. And yep. you, and you really make them your own as if they were <laughs> the Leonard Cohen song, as if they were, as if they were you, uh, how did you choose this particular batch of songs for, uh, for Spirit in the Room? Right. Well, the, first of all, I wanted to do songs, um, by some of my favorite songwriters. Right. So Ethan Johns, the man that's uh, producing me, he said, uh, you know, what? tell me what songwriters you, you really like, and, and we'll listen to stuff that they've done, and then we, we'll, hopefully, we'll find one, you know, that, that we can do. Mm. And, and that's what we did. Yeah. So we listened to a lot of Leonard Cohen songs, we listened to a lot of Paul McCartney, and then Odetta, you know, Hit or Miss, that's the one that I like from her. Yeah. And then Paul Simon, and... Um, Blind Willie Johnson and Tom Waite and Richard Thompson and Vera Hall Ward, uh, J, uh, uh, John Henry, you know, and um, uh, Low Anthem, yeah. uh, which uh, which I hadn't heard of before until Ethan played me this Low Anthem song, Charlie Darwin, and I thought, my God, you know, I have to do that. So it's basically songs of songwriters that I like. Right, and yet on the uh, but the but uh, here's what I want to throw out there: the approach on this record was so personal, it was so intimate by you and your producer. Uh, mm -hmm. And the way that the, I mean, it was recorded in a wooden r room, apparently, right? Yes, exactly. It's, uh, it was that in a, a place called Real World, which um, which is owned by uh, Peter Gabriel. Nice. Yeah, it was. Uh, a... and, it, and, it's, and it's weird because it's it's um, it's a place. It's a little place called Box in Wilshire, and um, the only other time I'd ever heard of this name was my grandmother was born there. Ah. And, and she had moved into Wales, you know, many years ago. And so, like, Box is, is a very small place. But Peter Gabriel has built a studio there, you know. Right. And uh, and so when we were recording there, that's why we called it Spirit in the Room. I, I, I felt something. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know whether, you know, whether it was that my grandmother was from there and she must have walked, because it was an old water mill. This, uh, this studio was an old water mill. And very close to where she came from. Mm. So I'm thinking when I was... Yeah, I thought, I wonder if she, you know, was ever in this, because it's a very old building. Yeah. Was there ever in here? So that's what we call it, Spirit in the Room, you know. Wow, it's beautiful. And what I was going to say before uh, was uh, Joni Mitchell used to record a little bit with uh, Peter Gabriel over at that studio. Uh, yes. And she said the same exact thing. She said there was something about this studio and the and the environment or the um, <laughs> the presence of, like, Muse or whatever it was in this room that was yeah. very special. Yeah, it's an old place. You know, it's an old... Um, building in an, an old village, you know, it's really uh, it's got it's got it's got something. It's more than just a recording studio. Yes, uh, for anybody joining us right now, you are of course watching Fairfield 2.0, and we're talking with Tom Jones' new album, uh, Spirit in the Room, and we were just talking about that spirit in the room. But now let's talk about some of the songs. Uh, my gosh, uh, well, first of all, there are a couple of Tom Jones songs on here. Uh, yeah, well, we took some songs, Ethan and I, and we'd heard parts of uh, songs and sort of used a part of one and, and used a part of another and sort of created created some songs ourselves. Yeah. So, um, so, so that was you know that was really interesting as well. Yeah, and that takes a good that takes a good relationship with somebody to be able to to come into a room and uh, and and blend songs, blend especially songs that you guys had already started elsewhere. Yes, it's um, it's a thing that. I mean, that's why I like working with Ethan. You, you start from scratch. You go in there, you know, you, we, we had to bring the tape machines into the room. That's how, and that's how funky this room is. <laughs> it's recorded. It's, uh, you've got to bring the, the, the equipment in there. But it's like, it's like being in a, in a rehearsal room somewhere, or somewhere hmm. where you, you like to get together with a bunch of musicians, some, uh, which is not a recording studio, you right. know, when you, when you want to get together and, and make some music. And, and that's what this place... It feels like so, and Ethan is like that. He picked this place on purpose right. so that we could we could try things out. Right. You know, we could nothing was written in stone. You know, right. there was no songs pre-picked and and uh, like uh, you know that I've done in the past. You know, and, and get the arrangements done, and then you just go in and record them. Right. All mm. this is from from scratch. Well, you know, well, we just we talk about songs that we like and we try them out different ways, 
until they sound as real as we can possibly make them, and, and we go with that. Nice. Well, the writing experience, traveling shoes, and Lone Pilgrim that that you that you had with Ethan. Uh, where did did the two of you? How did the two of you get together with that? In other words, how did those songs come together? Um, well, with 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 traveling shoes, you know, he he started off with this riff, the riff that's on there. Right. You know the the, the guitar riff right. that he plays. Right. You know, it, it it's like a it's it's like a rock and roll um, Chuck Berry type riff, if you like. Yeah. Type of thing, you know, and, and and sort of said, what you know, let's let's try and let's get something going on this thing. You know, and then I started singing, you yeah. know, some of the, some of the some of the words from uh, traveling shoes that I'd heard before. Yeah, but that's what I was that's where I was trying to get to. I just wanted to clarify what's going on with those two with those couple of songs, uh, but I yeah. want to get to. But let's get to some of these other the choices. For instance, Tower of Song. Tower of Song is like it was part of your soul. Yes. Well, Tower of Song, um, to me, it, it, uh, it could have been written about me. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, my friends are gone and my hair is gray, which is true. <laughs> you know, I, I ache in the places where I used to play. It's, <laughs> it's like, it's uncanny. And it's, and then there's, a, there's another verse in there, which, which is a bit, a bit bragging a bit. But, um, you know, I was born like this. I had no choice. I was born with a gift of a golden voice. You know, and I, I thought, my God. I, I, I mean, I, I could have written this, or I wish I wish I had. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so, you know that that's the kind of song that that is, and that's what we we were looking for. You know, songs that that sound real coming from me that could be about me. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Now, I, uh, another thing is, you have just come off of another collaboration with Ethan, uh, which was Praise and Blame, which we talked about. Yeah. I interviewed you for that also. Uh, yes. That album also had the same sort of, it had the same sort of personal, uh, just wrap the instruments around Tom approach. Um, yes. Uh, so so you, there, was a, there was a similarity. I mean, this when you guys were, in other words, to you, when you got together t making this record, it was, you guys were already old pals in this process. Yes. Mm. Yes, that's exactly what, what happened. So we went, you know, so we, we thought, like, there's lightning strike twice yeah. in the same place. So we, yeah. we went to the same room, yeah. you know, in, uh, in real world, and, and, uh, and that was it. So the, we knew that, that the feeling and, and what we got from the first record, hopefully we could, we could capture that again. You right. know, the same kind of feeling. Different yeah. songs. Different, slightly different in, in, uh, instrumentation, but the same feel right. that um, you know a very honest, stripped down, uh, real feeling. Yeah. Uh, by the way, anyone who's joining us now, we are talking with Tom Jones here on Fairfield 2.0. Uh, Tom, the other cool thing about this record is you. Um, it's been compared in some respects uh, to Rick Rubin's approach where Rick yes. was able to take Johnny Cash and, and actually make up an album that breathed. And I would and I would go as far as saying Neil Diamond, when he worked with Neil Diamond too, he made an album that breathed. You could almost hear him breathing between, <laughs> between exactly. lines. Uh, and that's what I would tell you about, that would be another opinion about my record, uh, about, about my thoughts on this record. Uh, but there are songs on here that are just wonderful, where the imagination uh, was playing around. For instance, When the Deal Goes Down. Um, yeah. Where you guys have it's almost like an old time carnival <laughs> setting. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's what that's what we try. When I heard the song, the structure of it, it sounded like uh, songs that I'd heard in this club that I used to go to in, in Wales. You know, there was a lot of old timers, old coal miners there that, that my father had worked with. You know, and and they had old songs that they knew. You know, from uh, from the turn of the century, you know, from nineteen hundred and. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's it reminded me of that. It, I, it sounded like some of those songs that, that that they would sing. It sounds like an old song. It sounds like a song from a different time. Yeah, you know, and that's so we tried to record it like that. We tried to get it to sound uh, that it came, you know, that it came from a different time, from from the days of the music hall, you know, and uh, and gas lamps, you know, and uh, like that. Yeah. So D Tom, so this. That, 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 but it was the structure of the song that, that sort of drove us that way. Yeah. Tom, I have to say personally, this is my favorite, probably as a collection of songs, this is my favorite album that you've done. And I'm, I almost, am, I would look forward to any album, more albums like this coming down the pike from you, because mm. um, this is a, this is a Tom Jones that's, uh, this is a Tom Jones that 
is can be everybody's pal and is more of a it's less and please forgive me for saying it like this but it seems like it's less the icon tom jones and more the man tom jones right well that's what we that's what we tried to do we tried mm -hmm. to get um a, a part of me that uh, people that hadn't heard on record before yeah you know like if i was in with a bunch of musicians somewhere which which i've done you know but but it's never had never been recorded you know songs that that I didn't get a chance to do when I was younger. And some of the songs um, fit more now than they would have done when I was a young man. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So I think the time is right now, you yeah. know, for, for me to do more basic, more um, soul-searching, you know, more inner uh, coming, com coming from me. Yeah. Less, you know, less performance, more um, singing, like if I was singing them to myself. Right. Well, that, well, to that point, which is interesting, to that point, when you, <laughs> I, you know, at some point, I'm sure you took this album and you listened to it from top to bottom. Was there anything mm -hmm. you discovered about Tom Jones when you listened to this album? Yeah, that it, that it, that it's me. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's very, it's a personal, it's what I sound like mm -hmm. without, without big arrangements. You know, without um, any, anything. Um, doing to sort of want to make a pop record. Right. You know, you, you, you go in with, with that in mind. You know, I want, I want to make something that'll jump, you know, something that's going to, you know, and, and, and that's, that's what I've done in, in the past yeah. with producers that, that want that. Yeah, right. But with Ethan, you know, that's, that's why I'm so pleased to work with him because he said, look, why don't we just make a record that we, we like, you know, that... that that we love doing, you know, that means something to us. And then hopefully it will translate to the public, Yeah, you know, and, and they'll feel that. And thank God, uh, so far, so good. So far, so good. Uh, yeah. We are talking with Tom Jones right now here at Fairfield 2.0. I, uh, I, I want to ask you, do you see yourself doing more albums like this in the future? Yes. Beautiful. In, yes. In fact, I'm going over to, um, to London next week. I leave on Saturday. And uh, I'm going to record with Ethan again. Nice. Uh, starting on the following Monday, so we're going to we're going to try some songs out for about a week, nice. you know, just to tread the water and see. Uh, it's a different studio. It's in it's in Wilshire, the same uh, county, and um, but it's another studio that that Ethan has found, which he said is you know is is similar to uh, to real world, mm -hmm. and um, to try and get as as real as as, as possible. He said, and I feel we can do it in this place if you'd like to come and uh, and do it so he's got some of my you know my favorite musicians are going to be them you know a rhythm section that he's handpicked and um we're going to go and just try some things out you know for, for a week and see see where it leads us beautiful i really really wish you good luck i want to see so much more of this type of material coming from you it's so it fits you so well it's just it's just a beautiful blend well, um, I, uh, well, here's, I have a traditional question. You, I asked you last time, let's do it again. Uh, and then I have a follow-up, little uh, tr new traditional question I want to ask you, which my traditional question is, what advice do you have for new artists? Um, first of all, to, to listen as much as possible to different things. Uh, don't copy. Try not to copy somebody. Try not to get so... Uh, to listen to, to, to one person or to one style of music and, and copy. Don't copy it because then you're going to sound like somebody else. You know, try and find yourself. Try and try and find yourself what you really want to do, you know, the way you really want to sing and and stick with that, you know, and, and, and be true to yourself because you could only, you, you know, there is only one of you, whoever you are, and, and you've got to, you've got to be true to yourself. You know, if you're not, then, then you're going to fake it, and then you won't enjoy it. Nice. So, if you're true to yourself, you know you'll have a ball. It's 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 a great business to be in if if you are yourself. Nice, so true. And uh, and Tom, what was the best advice you ever got? You think? Um, the first advice was I was working <laughs> I was working in a paper mill, and I was a young boy, and I was doing long shifts, you know. And and this this old chap said to me. I hear that you can sing. I said, "Yeah." He said, "Well, why don't you give it? A, why don't you give it a shot?" I said, "Well, I, I am. You know, I, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how to, you know, how to get into it. You know, I, mean, I was singing locally. You know, this was in, in my hometown. And this old fellow, he said, "Look, you go out there and give it the best shot you possibly can." You know, and he said, 
because you can you can always come back and do this. You know, what I mean? yeah. this is, you know but he said you will kick yourself. If you don't, because he had been in the British Army and he'd been all over the world and he'd had a great life. And, and he said, when you're old like me, what you've got left are memories. Make sure that they're good ones. Oh. And, you know, so he said, you do the best you can with whatever you've got. And, and he said, I've heard that you can sing. So you go and do that and give it your best shot. And then you won't have any regrets. At least you did try. So that's, that's the advice, you know, that, that's the advice that I took. Yeah. From this this old chap and and and, and I and I still believe that and that's what I would say to any young performer that's not sure you know oh should I really try it yes try it you know give it your best shot and and if you fail you fail but at least you try it beautiful I I don't even know how you top that I, I <laughs> Tom Jones I'm very appreciative that you uh, uh, that you had some time for us today here for Huffington Post and also for uh, Fairfield 2.0. Uh, this is a beautiful album. Anybody just joining us right now, uh, Tom Jones with an album, Spirit in the Room, uh, a collection of songs with uh, with songwriters such as Paul Simon, Richard Thompson, uh, Tom Waits, uh, Leonard Cohen, um, you know, Bob Dylan, just an amazing, a, a couple of blues songs, uh, originals by Tom. This is really, a, this is a bouquet. <laughs> um, and re- definitely enjoy this. Um, as I have enjoyed this conversation, I really appreciate it, Tom. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, that's all right, Mike. Nice talking to you. All right, you too. Take care and all the best. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.